So you wanna be a real estate investor, but where do you start? How do you know what information and sources to trust? That's where I come in. I'm Johnny Catani, and this is the Investor Relations Real Estate Podcast. Hey guys, real quick, before we start, go to investwithkatani.com and download my free ebook, Is Commercial Real Estate Recession Proof? Now to today's show. What's up guys, and welcome to another episode of the Invest Relations Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Johnny Katani, and I'm joined today by Amanda Hahn. As both a tax strategist and real estate investor, Amanda helps investors with strategies designed to supercharge their wealth building using entity structuring, self-directed investing, and income offset opportunities to keep more of what they make. Amanda has a highly rated book, Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor on Amazon. She has been featured in prominent publications, including Money Magazine, Talks at Google, CNBC, Smart Money Talk Radio, as well as Bigger Pockets Podcasts. Amanda, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. We're grateful to have you and very excited for today's conversation. Uh, you'll have to forgive my voice, uh, a little <laughs> under the weather. But um, take us back to the beginning. Uh, you know, what kind of caught your eye about being a CPA and, and then what led you to where you're at now? Yeah, yeah. Um, something interesting about me is I'm a, I'm a real estate, I mean, I'm a CPA by day. I am a real estate investor by night. And, um, you know, I, what got me, I, you know, being a CPA, I think it was just always uh, in the stars for me when I was young. Um, I was always taught to go to school, get good grades, get a, you know, steady, secure job. And what's more safe than being a CPA? Cause everyone has to file taxes, right? It's like, I'll never be unemployed. Um, and it wasn't until, so, so I did all that, you know, accomplished life's goals like that my parents, uh, <laughs> provided for me. Um, and then I read Robert Kiyosaki's, uh, book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which I'm sure a lot of our audience has, has done. And, um, when, at the time when I was reading his book, I was actually working in a, a large public accounting firm in the real estate group. So my day job at the time was to help real estate investors save on taxes. Um, but I just never knew that that was something I could do for myself it was always just like, wow, those really rich clients can use these strategies. And, and here I am just, you know, doing my day job. And, and that book really opened my eyes. Um, and my, my, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, um, we decided that we were going to get into real estate investing ourselves. And, um, and that's how we kind of, you know, got involved in, 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 in the real estate side of things as, as investors too. That's awesome. And I'm sure that's a huge help to fully understand it, not just from, you know, being a CPA or, or tax strategist, but actually being an investor and knowing exactly, you know, how investors view things and what they want. Um, so let's kind of get into it, right? Um, so actually having this conversation over the weekend about the incentives that are available through real estate to investors. Um, you know, I think as people, you know, especially in commercial real estate, because it's so much a, a business, um, you know, a lot of finance involved. I think people are more aware, but, you know, even if you're a small time person and you're doing, you know, small residential, maybe duplex and stuff, we still have some strategies available to us. So kind of talk about some of the things, you know, that, that we have available uh, as, as investors. Yeah. And I think, you know, you said something really, really important, which is, you know, for people who are doing commercial real estate, they see it as a business, right? A lot of times that's, that's kind of their full-time thing. That's all they do is real estate. Um, but it's important to understand from a tax perspective that even if you own one single family home, that's a rental property, or even if you don't own a single family rental, maybe you're just house hacking where you're renting out a room you know, or part of your house on the uh, Airbnb, um, you are still a business owner, right? Entrepreneur, you're in the business of investing in real estate. And so when we talk about tax strategies and tax planning, it's not just for the large investors, um, the Robert Kiyosaki's of the world. It is for, you know, mom and pop investors and just, you know, someone who's maybe in their early 20s and renting out a room to, you know, to their friends from college before. And so, um, a lot of times you hear people talk about, hey, you know, the, the tax code is unfair, right? It's skewed towards the wealthy. It's skewed to benefit people who are business owners. Well, 
the good thing is that as real estate investors, we are business owners as well in the eyes of the IRS, which means that when you hear people talk about taking deductions, writing off expenses to offset their income, um, all those, I don't want to say all, but most of those strategies are available to real estate investors as well. Um, and one of the things that um, I, I get asked all the time is when you say business owner, Amanda, do you mean like I have to have an LLC because I already started investing in real estate, but I don't have an LLC yet. Does it mean I need to form one right away or I can't write anything off? And it's really important to understand that those are two completely different things. So as soon as you own rental property, you are a business owner, right? IRS just says you're in the business of investing in real estate. It doesn't mean you have to have an LLC, right? So in other words, even if you don't have an LLC or corporation, you can still write off a lot of these expenses that are related to your real estate activities. Wow, that's fascinating. Okay, I didn't even realize that either. I thought you had to at least incorporate in some uh, entity uh, I know from speaking with, you know, especially in the commercial real estate world, asset protection is a big thing. So certainly a lot of people are forming LLCs in order to kind of put that layer of protection there. So kind of talk about now then, um, you know, some of the specific um, strategies and, and, you know, maybe let's start with you're just starting out some things to to build a foundation so you can start taking advantage of some of these things. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and I think it, um, it's definitely true that, you know, for people investing in real estate, you should consider having a legal entity, um, you know, especially for larger properties or even, you know, smaller properties where you have a lot of equity or high risk. Um, definitely, uh, you know, makes sense to speak to an attorney about whether an entity you know, makes sense for you from a protection perspective. Um, but in terms of tax deductions, you know, just even for someone starting out small, again, a, a single family or one duplex or even house hacking, um, it's really important to, you know, as investors, we're all really good about writing off our expenses that are specific to a property, right? Like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have mortgage interest and taxes and insurance. Um, maybe I'm paying management fees to a property manager. We're all really good about writing off those kinds of things. But what we typically see people miss out on are um, those what we consider overhead expenses. So expenses that we are spending money on personally, but um, is needed for our real estate. So a lot of things like, um, you know, car expenses when we're driving to look at properties or going to meetups, um, make sure you're tracking those car expenses because they are tax deductible, again, with or without a legal entity. Um, the, the ones with no legal entity are typically the newer investors, right? Just starting out, not sure what to do yet, but you're already incurring those expenses. And even before you might have purchased your first property, make sure you're tracking those because at some point you're going to be able to get a tax benefit for those. Um, but yeah, other things like home office, right? Most investors I know, including myself, um, we, I mean, use our home office for our rental properties. I'm not going to go out and rent an office space just to you know, manage my rental properties. And so um, really important um, because the home office basically allows us to take what are normally non-deductible expenses like you know, our, our house um, utilities and cleaning and, and home computer and things like that and shifting them into legitimate business deductions, right? Um, so those are some common ones, of course, you know, travel expenses. I think real estate investors were always looking for properties. So making sure you're planning ahead so that when you're traveling, um, that you're writing off those specific business related expenses. And, you know, the list just goes on and on, right? Like, um, you know, going to conferences, things open back up now. A lot of people are traveling to conferences. Um, we're at a conference, you know, meals, hotel, tax. I, don't know. I said taxi, but does anybody take taxi now? Everybody no, just goes on Uber, exist. right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, you know, Uber, um, obviously flight, um, going out to happy hour to network with everybody else. Um, those are all things you want to make sure you, you, you capture. Um, because, you know, in the past several years, we've been, you know, in the tax world, at least we've been on a, in, in a pretty good spot where, you know, tax uh, rates have been somewhat low. Um, but I think if you ask any CPA or, you know, people in the industry, the, the expectation is that tax rates won't go down. If anything, it'll probably go up. And um, if you are of the belief that taxes will go up in the future, then it makes sense to make sure you capture all of your expenses um, because those will save you, um, you know, at much higher tax rates, right? When, if and when they increase those rates. Yeah, absolutely. I know that, um, you know, for me specifically, right, uh, 
of course, travel. Well, I, I really am trying to write, write off as much as I can, um, you know, especially in the beginning. So uh, from the CPA standpoint, what does what's the best way for investors, business owners to give you all the information you need? Do we need to be keeping every single receipt, itemized statements, you know, kind of talk about how to give it to our to our um, tax team and, and yeah. to make it as easy as possible for them? Yeah, that's a great question. I love that question from clients. <laughs> um, so, so in terms of the system, right? What method is that I get all the time? Do I need to um, have QuickBooks? Do I just use Excel? Do I use Stessa? Um, oh, and I want to tell people too. The answer depends on you. Everybody's a little bit different. And so, if you're someone who's really good with Excel, then that might be perfect. Um, if you're someone who's really good with different types of software, you're quick at learning those things, and QuickBooks is great. It does help you to automate a lot of things where you can sync it up with your bank account and download all the transactions. So all you really have to do is tell it, you know, this is marketing, that's a repair, you know, this is for property one, that's for property two, and then it'll, you know, create all the financial statements. Um, but, you know, if neither of those work for you and you're using like, you know, ledger, pen and paper, um, then that's fine as well. And then, but, but the important part of it is you, you, you want to use a system that makes sense for you, that comes easy to you. Why? Because you're the one who's doing it, right? Or if not you, you have an assistant or you have a system to do it, but the system has to be one that works for you. Um, and what we found is sometimes, you know, CPAs will say, oh, I really want you to use QuickBooks. And what happens if the investor doesn't like QuickBooks um, is that they'll buy the software and then it'll go on a shelf, that nice shelf behind you right there, right? it's going to go on there, it's going to be displayed. And then a year later, when it's time to do your taxes, it's like, oh man, well, there's that, you know, the software is back <laughs> on my shelf and here's my box of receipts, right? So um, just choosing a system that works best for you and your team. Um, in terms of receipts, um, yes, there are some receipts you have to keep, some that you don't based on dollar amount and what those are, but for me, I like to simplify and systemize everything, right? Instead of having the investor memorize, what do I need to keep receipts for? I just usually tell people, every receipt you have that could be a business deduction, just take a picture of it, right? Or if it's already electronic, there's nothing you need to do. Take a picture of it as long as it's somewhere at some point, if you're ever audited is when you'll need to find it. Um, but guess what? The odds of being audited currently is extremely, extremely low. So you don't want to waste a lot of time organizing and making the receipts all pretty. You just want to make sure you capture what it is. And, you know, hopefully if at some point you do need to find it, you'll know where to take it up, you know, some in some 2022 folder or something like that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's a uh, really great. Uh, I appreciate that explanation because I know, you know, a lot of people will just keep everything right. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to run any risks. That's how my grandparents did for their business. Um, you know, a little more old school, uh, me, of course, I prefer digital everything. So ideally, you know, getting digital receipts, which is as easy as it comes. Right. And ideally you're filing in at least some sort of folder. So you're not chasing it around. Um, but again, the IRS is very backed up right now. <laughs> um, I started my, well, officially filed my business in December and uh, did an S corp election at around the same time. And just barely, like literally before this meeting opened a letter from the IRS that they received it and approved it. And it's six months later. So, oh yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's quick. We have people who filed the S elections last year that still haven't received anything. So um, yeah, definitely backed up. But yeah, I think, you know, digit digitizing the receipts, I think is by far the easiest, um, you know, right now, wherever you shop, people will say, right, do you want to email to you or do you want it printed? Um, but, you know, taking a picture and just throw it in a folder once a month, you know, gather up all those little pictures that look like receipts um, makes it, things a lot easier. Right? Absolutely. So let's now talk about, you know, um, maybe the step up or even above that, you know, where we, you know, maybe we have, you know, 100 million under, maybe 50, 100 million under, assets under management, you know, we have a legitimate business going, um, you know, more people may be involved in different things like that. What are some ways and some tools that we can use to make sure we're, we're keeping everything in order for that as well? Yeah, I mean, if you have, you know, once you, um, 
you know, using something like Excel or even a ledger um, is perfectly fine for smaller operators. Small operator meaning just you and yourself, right? Or you and a spouse. Um, whenever you start getting into larger deals that involve other partners, right? It, it, it could just be you and another partner that's unrelated to you, or it could be a syndication where it's you and a hundred other investors. Um, those generally you'll need some kind of an accounting software, right? Because we're no longer just tracking expenses. We're now tracking everybody's capital accounts. How much did John put in? How much did Amanda put in? How much did everybody put in? What are we giving out to distributions? Um, and so, so you know, typically we, we, we see people use QuickBooks, but there are, you know, obviously other softwares that do similar things. And it's really, really important um, because, you know, in a, in a partnership or in a syndication, you're responsible for other people's money. And so transparency is going to be key. But also when you get to, um, you know, those larger level deals, the tax planning becomes um a lot more fun and impactful too, right? You're talking about, um, you know, even like a million dollar deal. Um, there are really great ways to take write-offs where, you know, even with depreciation in the first year could be like a $300,000 tax deduction, right? So, um, you know, the larger the deal, the, the, the more exciting the tax planning becomes from our perspective. I love that that excites you. And of course, as investors, you know, the larger deals we do, same thing, right? You just, you know, more zeros involved, more people involved, at least for me. Um, you know, certainly people enjoy the the smaller side of things, and I appreciate that. But I definitely, it gets me more excited when there's, there's kind of more involved there, um, you know, more problems to solve, so to speak, maybe big, bigger business to run. Um, so when you're structuring entities there, I know for each deal, you're doing individual LLC. So it's probably very important to keep, um, you know, everything itemized specific to that deal. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we, you know, we have clients who, um, you know, have multiple um, deals going on, right? Let's say even multiple syndications. And that's one of the first rules I always tell either them or their CFO, whoever's, you know, <laughs> dealing with us on the accounting side, um, is we don't want to have a lot of transfers between the entities, right? So Main Street LLC and, you know, Desert Breeze LLC, <laughs> they're maybe just owned by the same people, but, you know, we don't like to see a lot of money going back and forth between the two, uh, because that's when it gets really messy, right? You got one entity paying the expenses of another entity. So <laughs> always trying to avoid those types of things. Yeah, that's, wow, fascinating. Yeah, I'm sure I can imagine you've probably looked at some stuff and been like, wow, there's some cleanup here. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then is there any, you know, like, what are some things that we can mess up that could potentially be detrimental? Kind of talk about maybe some little things or even some big things that, you know, you see go unlooked that could you know, hurt us uh, when it comes to do be tax time. Yeah, I mean, I think um, legal entity structuring is one of those things that are really, really important to get it set up correctly to begin with. Um, and this is always kind of a, you know, kind of a consideration just for someone starting out even, right? It's like, well, I'd love to have the right entity. I'd love to have a CPA and an attorney and that all sounds great, but they all cost money. And so maybe I'll try to do it myself on LegalZoom. I'll just listen to some podcasts and go ahead and do it myself. And um, if you're smart enough to get it done and, and, and do it correctly, that's great. Um, but if you're unsure at all, definitely makes sense to work with, you know, with the legal team and the tax team to help you. And the reason for that is because I've seen it time and time again, where people start out in the wrong entities with real estate assets. And if they don't figure out that that's a problem until a year to even two years down the road, um, sometimes it becomes very costly to make that correction. Um, or sometimes, you you know, we have clients even <laughs> um, as, you know, as recent as like last month, uh, who I unfortunately have to tell them, you know, there's not a cheap or easy way to fix it. Right. And it might be something that we just kind of have to live with the issue um, until the market changes drastically or something like that. Um, so that's one of those things. I think, you know, generally speaking, try not to hold appreciating properties in an S corporation. Right. I know you said you formed the S corp, you know, assuming that's kind of for the active side, right. Of, Correct. You know, sponsoring and syndicating things like that. Um, but we don't ever want to hold the real estate 
in an S corp. Uh, that's one common example I see where people are doing it incorrectly. You know, maybe because they didn't know, or maybe their tax person wasn't well versed in, in real estate, and so gave them advice way back when. Um, those last one of those things, if you know, I bought a property for hundred thousand dollars, now it's worth five hundred thousand, and I've always held it in an S corp. That becomes very problematic because. Um, it's entirely likely that I might not get all the tax depreciation benefits from the property. Um, and it's very expensive for me to move it out. Wow. Interesting. Okay. That's a very, very good tidbit there for sure. Because, um, you know, I know, you know, depending on what you're doing, right. The S corp election very much has its benefits, but this is one where it's not in, um, you know, me, I had no idea how to set things up. So I went and used a, a specifically a SEC specialized attorney. Highly recommend that you guys, um, you know, again, if you are an attorney or know how to do it, great. But even not just an attorney, but specifically real estate or even commercial real estate folks attorney, make sure you're doing everything correctly. You know, maybe even like for me, I registered in Wyoming, right? A little bit more favorable towards asset protection. So even little nuances like that that I didn't know um, yeah. are things you can learn and, and make sure you're set up correctly. Um, one thing I want to talk about, uh, bonus depreciation. Um, you know, everybody loves to talk about it. Uh, so kind of talk about, you know, kind of, I guess, explain what it is a little bit for those who may not know what it is and then, um, you know, how we can use it to our advantage. Yeah, sure. So we'll start with depreciation first, right? Before we talk about the bonus. So, so as real estate investors, we get to take depreciation um, uh, uh, on the building of a property. So, so what that means is, if you know, if I buy a property, I spend one hundred fifty thousand dollars on a property. If a hundred thousand of that is the building, I can write that off. Usually for residentials, twenty seven and a half years. For commercials, thirty nine years. And um, so, so, so in the residential world, you know, I'm taking the, the building divided by 27, right? So 127th is what I can write off every single year. Um, now, um, to take that a little bit further, what investors can do is what's called a cost segregation or accelerated depreciation. That basically means you are having a cost segregation firm. These are usually people who are uh, have engineering background. Um, so they'll go out and they'll look at this building. So instead of just saying $100,000 of building, they're going to break out the components of that building. Okay, of that 100, maybe there's 10,000 of specialty plumbing, there's 5,000 of flooring, 6,000 of cabinets. And once they do those breakouts, then your tax person is going to be able to calculate faster depreciation. So flooring, for example, instead of writing it off over multiple years, we might be able to write it off immediately this year because of bonus depreciation. So bonus depreciation is still available for 2022, um, which again, just means that, you know, instead of writing it off over multiple years, like five years or seven years or 15 years, we're writing it all off immediately. Um, you know, the bonus depreciation is, is great. And that was where the example of saying, you know, if you had a million dollar building this year, we're probably expecting close to $300,000 of first year depreciation using cost segregation and bonus and things like that. And so, um, you know, very, very significant, right? Because you think, you know, million dollar property, you might be able to get it with just $200,000 down payment. And so $200,000 to get you a $300,000 first year depreciation. Uh, that sounds really, really amazing, right? So, um, but the key is this, so this year is still 100%. Uh, next year in 2023, it's scheduled to go down to 80%, which is slightly lower, but still really, really great. Yeah, absolutely. I love it so much. And I love explaining it to people for the first time, you know, like first time investors and them really starting to see the, you know, the power of, of investing in real estate and why so many of us believe in it, um, you know, for that reason. And uh, you know, I had a friend, he works in sales, obviously makes most of his money on commission. He's like, oh man, I got crushed this year in taxes. My CPA literally told me I should start investing in real estate. And I was like, that's awesome. You know, that you have someone who can point you in that direction. So you're, you know, you can at least start to, you know, create that wealth and, and, you know, nobody wants to give all their money to the IRS. Um, so you mentioned that bonus appreciation is dropping to 80%. Um, is there any other legislation you keep an eye on that 
could be affecting that or any other of these tax strategies? <laughs> always, always. Um, so uh, yeah, last year, and so in 2021, there's a lot of um, you know proposals about tax changes. And in fact, I don't know if you recall, um, there, were, there, there was a target on the backs of real estate investors, right? One of the things that President Biden had talked about was trying to eliminate the, um, a lot of the unfair advantages uh, of real estate investors. And um, the good news was by the end of the year, none of those proposals were passed. And so we kind of all had a sigh of relief, right? Uh, but that was short-lived. So in March of 2022, um, the administration released the 2023 budget. And so within their budget, you know, they talk about basically how, you know, what, what they want to spend money on. But part of that needs to talk about how we're going to get the money, where we're going to get the money to spend. Um, so you get a glimpse into what, what, is, what are the thoughts behind tax increases. Um, so a couple ones that we're keeping an eye on um, for real estate investors. Um, one is increases to marginal tax rates. So just ordinary tax rates. Uh, and that's important for real estate investors because you know when we have active income from syndications, with, when we have taxable rental income, they're all at ordinary tax rates, right? Um, so the, the, the part of the, the potential proposal will be to increase that from 37% to 39% and also impacting people at lower, uh, much lower income levels. So for singles, uh, 400,000 and above, for married individuals, for 50 and above combined. So huge marriage penalty for people who are trying to decide if they should get married or not. <laughs> wow. You typically see it going in the opposite direction for marriage, right? It's more in your favor you know, like uh, selling your home, your main residence, right? Yeah, um, yeah, or, yeah, doubling, right? So yeah. like if you're single, you get 250. If you're married, you get 500. Uh, and this is what we were thinking too, right? So they said, okay, we're not gonna, you know, one of the, the comments was we're not gonna raise taxes for people who make under 400. So we're staying true to that because if you're single, you make 400 or less, you're in, your tax is not going up. And you, so you would think as a married couple, then it's 800, right? Because we're each going to make 400. But no, as a married, you only get 450 total. <laughs> um, so that's what we're keeping an eye on, right? Again, that impacts, you know, not just W-2 or business owners, but also real estate investors too. Um, the other big one is 1031 exchange, right? Of course, um, 1031 exchange is one of those um, you know, wonderful uh, strategies that investors can use where we sell a property with a lot of gain, but don't have to pay any taxes as long as we are reinvesting the money into uh, replacement property. So right now there's no limit, meaning, um, you know, Jonathan, you can sell and have a $10 million gain. You can 1031 exchange and defer all of that into bigger, better properties and pay no taxes if you wanted to, right? If you follow all the rules, you can do all that. So one of the proposals is to have a limit on that of up to $500,000 per Jeez. year per taxpayer. So that means if you sold, you know, you sold a property for, let's say, um, $2 million of gain, you can 1031 exchange, but only helps you to defer $500,000 and you can have to pay taxes on the other $1.5. So very, very significant. <laughs> wow. They really are, do have a target on our backs. Uh, any idea why that is? why that is uh i think it's just the narrative right is um you know people are always talking about uh you know wealthy people not paying enough taxes um you know real estate investors are, are typically painted as is you know bad landlords right landlords and greedy people and um and just you know a lot of loopholes i mean i think the fact that real estate investors get tax benefits is is not a secret right everybody knows that um but I think what oftentimes maybe the lawmakers aren't seeing uh, is going back to the original intent. Why do we have these benefits? Uh, and, and, you know, looking at the alternative, which is why are these people paying less taxes? Well, investors are paying less taxes because we're incentivized to do the right things. And I see this in real life scenarios all the time. You know, for example, I have a client who's an investor, you know, maybe they own an apartment. 
And um, the question becomes, you know, should I do some improvements this year? Should I replace all the appliances for my tenants this year? And my answer would be, yeah, because this year we have bonus depreciation. Let's do it sooner rather than later. And so you'll get a tax benefit and your tenants will have, uh, you know, a better um, living environment too, right? So, so <laughs> why the target is it? Because the incentive is designed to help us achieve a goal. Um, but, you know, then there are other, you know, naysayers who are saying, well, that's not fair, right? <laughs> yeah, that, that was a very, very great explanation. I, I tell people the same thing, right? The reason those incentives are there is because you're literally, you know, talking about at least in the space of, you know, multifamily, um, which is the most common asset class we talk about is you're literally talking about a necessity of life, right? Mm -hmm. a place someone needs to live. So there's incentives to give them better quality of living and, you know, um, so yeah, it is pretty fascinating um, to see and definitely something we'll be keeping an eye on. Uh, hopefully the bonus appreciation comes back in our favor, you know, doesn't get too far, too far down. Cause I know it's on a, every year moving forward is, is going to drop 20%, correct? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Now, the good thing about all this is these are just a glimpse um, that we see on the intent of potential proposals. It's, you know, in, in nowhere close to um, becoming reality just yet. So at this point, we're just kind of, you know, keeping an eye on what's going on and, and not really making any rash decisions. But what I am telling investor clients to do is to look at your portfolio. So if you have a portfolio of, of, of you know, X number of properties, really take a look at which are the ones you probably want to keep long term. And which are the ones that you might want to reposition into other deals um, and, you know, maybe sell and reinvest in other places. And the reason to be doing that now is that, again, right now we have, you know, 1031 exchange with no limit. Um, our tax rates are still low. And so if you did do pull those moves this year, then, I mean, if as long as you start figuring out what are some of the potential moves, then you can act fairly quickly. You know, let's say something comes out in a couple of months and says, hey, that will be the new law in 2023. Well, I already know which ones I'm going to sell. I'm going to get started to sell. Them. Um, you don't want to be stuck in December and figuring out, OK, well, now they're going to pass the law in a month. And what am I really going to do? I haven't really thought about any of this yet. Right. So just being prepared, um, but not really having to pounce on anything specific just yet. Right. Knowing your multiple exit strategies. Awesome. I love that. Thank you for that insight. That's that's uh, very wise to be paying attention to that stuff for sure. And, and it can get overlooked, right? Um, which is why we're grateful we have people like Amanda to lead us, uh, you know, and, and show us show us the way there. So as we kind of wind down here, I've got five questions I asked all of my guests. So we'll jump to those. Uh, first question, best advice you've gotten from a mentor? Best advice I've gotten from a mentor um, is, uh, well, not really a mentor yet. Um, I read uh, Dan Sullivan's book, Who Not How, and um, it's one of my favorites because I'm someone who's always asking how. <laughs> I, I love learning, and I think that um, becomes detrimental to me because I'm always wanting to know how, and um, I think it's really empowering for all business owners. And, you know, again, real estate investors are business owners, too. Um, even talking about CPA and taxes, right, is the, con the concept of you don't have to do everything. You don't have to know the how. You don't have to know how to save taxes, how to do depreciation. You need to have a who, and that person and you trust who will give you the ideas and help you to save taxes without you having to become a CPA. <laughs> I love that. I love that book so much. When I joined my mastermind group, that's the book that came with it and uh, changed mine and my uh, girlfriend, like I made her read it too. And she's an entrepreneur as well. And, you know, um, for so long, I think, you know, if you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, kind of these old school mindsets that, who not how is like, yeah, no, that's absolutely not how this works. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> this concept of like almost, you know, multiplying time because, you know, you're hiring people to do tasks that your time, not to say you can't learn how to do it or understand it, but you know, probably not the best thing for your time to be spent doing. So mm -hmm. yep. I love it. Uh, what is it about your career that makes you feel like you're fulfilling your why? Oh, um, gosh, you know, I, for my career, um, you know, in helping people save taxes, it's just really my passion. I feel like that um, taxes are, are often pitched as like, you know, scary, 
or boring or just something to be avoided, right? I think even you were saying earlier, like, oh, it's been a while since we talked about this topic, probably because you're trying to avoid it. It's not <laughs> as fun or sexy as raising money or, you know, cash flow. Um, but tax savings is, is probably one of the biggest erosions of wealth. And for people who are getting into real estate, is they're really, they're really doing it for, for cash flow. They're doing it to get their time back. And so it's really important to uh, make sure you're not just making money, but also doing things correctly to save money. Um, because, you know, if you're like the average American who loses probably close to 50% of their income to taxes, and I don't just mean income tax, you know, property tax, sales tax, all those different taxes. Um, if you can, you know, cut your taxes by even a little bit, it probably means you can work less, right? And, and keep the same amount of net profit. So Awesome. I love that. Okay. May know the answer to this one, but favorite non-real estate or investment related book? <laughs> non real estate but I, mean, I really like who not how um i also like atomic habits that's another one that i um that i've read recently um you know just uh baby steps in 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 well, to create really powerful results absolutely uh if you could have any superpower what would it be superpower oh my gosh um fly <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah uh, that's absolutely mine as well. Really? <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, that would be so awesome, right? Like, you know, <laughs> totally reduce my expenses on travel. I mean, listen, <laughs> as much as you can expense things, you just have to pay for it up front, right? Like yes. we talk about writing stuff off, but it's like, right. yeah, it comes back, but I have to right. pay for it first. Right. I can eliminate flying. <laughs> be I'd be so free. I'd get anywhere quickly. Exactly. avoid the California, Southern oh, California traffic. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. It stresses me out just thinking about it. <laughs> I love it. Awesome. Last one. What's the best way for people to get a hold of you? Um, so uh, probably through my website, which is keystonecpa.com. Uh, there you can find my contact information. And we also have a downloadable ebook uh, called Tax Strategies for the Savvy Real Estate Investor. Um, and, you know, if you want to learn more about how to shift income to reduce taxes or uh, what to consider when forming legal entities for your real estate or how to use your retirement money for real estate today uh, without taxes and penalties. Um, you can download that on our website. Um, and I'm also on social media too, uh, ahan127. Awesome. We'll link down the show notes. Amanda, thank you so much for your time and all of your insight. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching today's episode. I hope you really enjoyed it. Listen, I know it's cliche and you hear it all the time, but please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel so you know when the next video is coming out. Even though this is technically a daily podcast, you know it's coming out the next day. Um, we have a ton of content coming your way. So please like and subscribe. It helps a ton. Leave comments. We'd love to know what you guys think and uh, we will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.